Limiting reagent calculations, good times, right? These are typically some of the hardest questions that show up in all of first semester general chemistry. Students hate these, they get a reputation for being the worst things ever. They are not so bad because you're dealing with things that are a little bit abstract, like atoms and molecules that you don't normally visualize in your head. It's a pain in the butt. If we did this with anything else that you're used to seeing, it wouldn't be so bad. So let's just pretend for a minute that I decide I'm going into business and I'm building bicycles. And I'm going to scavenge all the junkyards around and I'm going to look for bicycle frames and bicycle tires. And I managed to find for myself in my first journey 20 bicycle frames and 34 tires. And I'm going to assemble as many two-wheeler bicycles as I possibly can. How many bikes can I make? <laughs> how many bicycles can I get out of this? 17. 17. So what limited how many bicycles I could actually get? The tires. The tires. And we would call that the limiting reactant or limiting reagent. Is it the same thing? Same thing. Okay. So whether I say reactant or reagent, same diff. Cool. Tires limited how many bicycles I could get. And in this case, how many frames would I have left over? Three. I'd have three of them left over. So we'd call this the reagent. in excess, which I like to abbreviate as XS. So reagents in excess, the one left over, and you very easily calculated that there were three left over. Life is good. But if we do this with atoms and molecules and things of this sort, students get totally hosed. And there's two reasons. One, this is easy to see. You're used to looking at bicycles, and you can easily see that one bicycle has two frames and, or I'm sorry, two tires in one frame, so on and so forth. But we're not used to looking at molecules. And also, we can compound the issue here because with atoms and molecules, we don't usually tell you how many you have. We often tell you how much uh, mass you have instead. And you've got to convert it to moles before you can make such a comparison. So notice if we want to make a chemical reaction out of this, we could say that one frame plus two tires gives you one bicycle. Life is good. To find the limiting reactant, so every time you do this reaction, if we'll call it that, it takes one frame and two tires. If I have 20 frames, assuming the frame was limiting reagent, how many times could I do this process? 20 times. If I have 34 tires and it takes two tires to do this process, how many times could I do this process? 17. Whichever one you can do less times, that's your limiting reactant. And that number of times you actually do it will lead to calculating your theoretical yield, we'll call it. So in this case, all I did was take each of these numbers of my reactants here, and I divided them by their corresponding coefficients in the balanced reaction. Whichever number comes out lower, that's your limiting reagent. Let's apply this to something a little more abstract. We're going to deal with this reaction right here. How many moles of nitrogen do I start with? One. How many moles of hydrogen do I start with? Three. Wrong on both counts. So this balanced chemical reaction never tells you what you start with. It never tells you what you have, anything of the sort. It only tells you the ratio in which things react. So this sells, this, what this ultimately tells you is that for every one mole of nitrogen you do have, you will need three times as many moles of hydrogen to produce twice as many moles of NH3. That's what it tells me, but it never tells me what I actually have to start with. That is extra information that has to be provided in the context of a problem. So notice, the first question under limiting reagent calculations on your handout there is how many moles of hydrogen gas are required for six moles of nitrogen gas to react completely? So when I ask you, how many moles of nitrogen gas do we start with? It's six moles. It was extra information not contained within a balanced chemical reaction at all. Cool. So if I have six moles of nitrogen, do I need more or less moles of hydrogen for this to react completely? More. In fact, how many times more? Six. Uh, not six times more. What's the ratio here? Three times, more. three times more. It's a three to one ratio. And we use that mole to mole ratio again at the hardest of geometry here. I'll put moles of nitrogen on the bottom, moles of hydrogen on top, and just use the coefficients. Three moles of hydrogen for every one mole of nitrogen. And this you could probably do in your head without writing it out like this, but this will be instructive for later on. And so we would need 18 moles of hydrogen for that six moles of nitrogen to react completely. Let's keep going with this. How many moles of hydrogen gas are required for 56 grams of nitrogen to react completely? Why is this harder? Because it's in grams. 
Notice this ratio of 3 to 1 is a ratio of not moles. moles, not grams. So if you've got grams, what's the first thing you need to do? Convert it to moles. Fantastic. And how do I turn grams into moles? What's my connection? It's not Avogadro's number. Good. It's the molar mass right off the periodic table. And what does one mole of N2 weigh? And it's N2, by the way. Yeah. Careful, it's not O2, it's N2. You looked at oxygen. <laughs> yeah, don't make that mistake on the test. Good, 28. Cool, and in this case, 56 divided by 28 is? Two moles of N2. Cool, so this becomes a much easier question all of a sudden. If I have two moles of N2, how many moles of H2 would need to be, would it need to be reacted with to react completely? Well, three times as many, so six, six moles. And again, we would formally write that out by putting moles of N2 in the denominator, moles of H2 in the numerator, and just using the coefficients in that mole to mole ratio. And two times three is six moles of H2. Cool, so still dealing with the same chemical reaction of N2 plus three H2 going to two NH3. And now we're going to start with 128 grams of N2, 30.0 grams of H2, and we've got a series of three questions. First one says, which is the limiting reagent? Uh, H2. So, and you might think so, but it's not so easy to determine. You're like, oh, I got less of him. Must be. Not necessarily the case. Um, the next question is, how much NH3 is formed? And that actually might be read as, what is the theoretical yield of NH3? And then finally, how much of the reagent in excess is left over? So, again, what I do know from this lovely reaction is that for every mole of nitrogen, I need three times as mole, many moles of hydrogen. And it's a mole to mole ratio. Do I have a mole to mole ratio? I don't. So what's the first thing I should do? Uh, yeah, we will get the molar mass right off the periodic table and convert both of these to moles. So grams of N2 on the bottom, moles of N2 on top, grams of H2 on the bottom, moles of H2 on top. And it's always the mass of one mole for molar mass. And for nitrogen, we already decided that was? Well, again, but it's N2, not N, so 28 grams. And for H2, similarly, it's not one, but two. And in this case, math is much easier to do down here. Um, and in this case, we've got 15 moles of H2. And now this is probably something you're going to want to use your calculator for. So, because this is not going to be a nice whole number. What does this come out to? Uh, 4.57. Cool. So, from here, if I want to find out the limiting reagent, I want to look at both of these and figure out how many times could I possibly do this reaction as written. With 4.57 moles of N2, how many times could I do this reaction as written? Well, every time I do it, how many moles of nitrogen are required? Ooh, careful, it's N2 we're talking about. One. So if I've got 4.57 moles, how many times can I do this reaction? Well, I'll divide. It takes one every time. So if I've got 4.57, I can do the reaction 4.57 times. So essentially, I'm just dividing by its coefficient to find out how many times we can do it. So with 15 moles of H2, how many times can we do this reaction as written? Five times. You divide by three in this case. So divide both of these by their coefficient. Whichever one leads to a smaller number is your limiting reagent. And it's going to be this guy. It leads to 4.57 versus 5. And so in this case, was hydrogen your limiting reagent just like your intuition told you? It was not. So this is my limiting reactant here, the 4.57 moles of N2. And if that is indeed my limiting reactant, that's what limits how much product I can get. So just like we did back here with the frames and the tires, which one of these did we actually use to figure out how many bicycles we could make? The limiting, the limiting reagent. And so we're going to do the same thing over here. We're going to use the limiting reagent to figure out how much of the product we can make. And in this case, the product is NH3. And I will compare the moles of NH3 to moles of N2. Get that mole to mole ratio. And what is that mole to mole ratio? Awesome. Two moles of NH3 for every one mole of N2. The coefficient's right out of the balanced reaction. And so in this case, 
What is the maximum number of moles of NH3 I could get here if we do the math here? Yep, 9.14 moles of NH3. This is the maximum number we could get. If everything works perfectly, you get this, but things usually don't work out perfectly. So we sometimes call this the theoretical yield. Theoretically, if everything goes perfect, this is the amount we should get. Hardly ever do things go perfect. Most reactions come to what we call an intermittent equilibrium, where not all the reactants have reacted. Most reactions have side products, where some of the reactants actually get used up making stuff you don't want. So we almost never quite reach this. And so in a little bit, we'll talk about something called the percent yield, which kind of relates how much you actually get, your actual yield, and compared to this maximum theoretical yield. Cool, so that's the second question, how much NH3 is formed? Well, assuming 100% yield, that's the 9.14 moles of NH3. But if you notice, it just said how much is formed. It never said what units. If they didn't want moles, what else they could ask? They could ask for grams. So depending on what your multiple choice answer is, this could come out in units of moles or grams. So let's convert this just in case. How would I convert this to grams? Yeah, molar mass. So I'll put moles of NH3 on the bottom. It's always one mole. And the grams of NH3 on top. And in this case, one mole of NH3 weighs 17 grams. And what do we get here for the mass of 9.14 moles of NH3? Uh, Fantastic. So 155.4 grams of NH3. So either one of these is the theoretical yield just expressed in two different sets of units. And now the hard question. How much of the reagent in excess is left over? So let's go back in time for a minute. Back to talking about bicycles, because this was easier. How many frames were left over? Three. Three. Great. How'd you do that? You just did it in your head. No calculator needed. It's going to be way harder over here. How did you do this in your head? Good, assuming your limiting reactant is used up completely. So in this case, two tires, for every two tires you need one frame. If all 34 tires get used up, then how many frames would get used up? Well, half as many. So 17 get used up. We started with 20, 17 get used up, we have three left. Great, we're gonna do the same kind of calculation here. In this case, we'll look at our limiting reagent. So, and in this case, 4.57 moles of N2, we're gonna assume it all reacts completely, it's our limiting reagent. If 4.57 moles of N2 reacts completely, how many moles of H2 would get used up reacting with it? Three times, Three times as many. Awesome. So the 4.57 moles of N2 would require three times as many moles of H2, right from the coefficients in the balanced reaction. And how many moles of H2 would that be? Okay, so what we see here is that we started out with 15 moles of H2. We are going to use up 13.7 moles. And so how many do we have left? Uh, cool. And that is the number of moles we have left in excess. But again, the question is said how much is left in excess. That could be a question asking for the number of moles. It also could be a question asking for the number of grams. So if we wanted to convert this to grams, Connection between moles and grams is always the molar mass, and the mass of one mole of H2 is two grams. And so in this case, that would be 2.6 grams of H2 in excess. Okay, let's look at this one more way. So let's say I gave you, Natali, let's say I gave you enough money to go buy me 10 oranges at the store and you only came back with eight. You got greedy, spent a little on yourself. Only came back with eight. What would be the percent yield? I was expecting 10 oranges, you only came back with eight. 80%. Eight is what you actually brought me back. 10 was theoretically what I expected you to bring me back, and eight out of 10 is 80%. Same kind of thing here. We expect a maximum of 155.4 grams. What if I told you that our actual yield when we did this reaction, was only 100 grams 
of ammonia. That's all we produced. So then what would be my percent yield in this case? Not, is that what you did when uh, we did the oranges? No. It's no, not. It's Good, so your percent yield. Good, actual over theoretical times 100. The reason you thought it might have been the other is because you might be confusing this with percent error. And percent error says take the true value minus the calculated value all divided by the true value times 100. But that's something else entirely. Percent yield is just actual over theoretical times 100. So in this case, it would be 100 grams over 155.4 grams times 100. What do we get? 64.35% would be our percent yield in that case. Questions?